I'm Irma Garza. Thanks for watching Legislative Update on the Edinburgh Cable Network. Today we are honored. We have our Congressman Ruben Hinojosa representing District 15 uh, in the state of Texas. Thank you so much for stopping by to visit with us. Always a pleasure to see you and we are super excited. This is the first time you come visit us in our studio and we welcome you. I'm delighted, Irma. This uh, studio is awesome. It's just terrific. It's set up in a way that is very comfortable, friendly, and uh, having you ask questions uh, as we do this dialogue for the city of Edinburgh and the surrounding area, the county of Hidalgo, where I represent over 500,000 people. I am the voice and I vote for over 500,000 people in Hidalgo County. This is a great opportunity to bring to up to date as of sep uh, beginnings of September, what is uh, happening in Washington. And uh, certainly with your help, I think we can bring information that will be informative and current from your Congressman Ruben Hinojosa. And, and that's why we are so glad that you are here. A lot going on. They keep you really busy uh, in Washington for us. And, and there is certainly a lot of focus on Washington right now, particularly on the topic of Syria. Can you give us an update on that? Let me say that the Syrian crisis is one that has uh, moved out many of the other issues that were so very important, such as comprehensive immigration reform, such as the education uh, loans to college students. Many issues on transportation are being set aside so that we can be fully informed in Congress and in the Senate to be able to vote sometime next week. It could be as early as Wednesday. And I believe that uh, people have asked me, how do I feel about it? Will I support the president or will I not? And I have simply said this. First, we have to understand that the resolution that we will be voting on is not to go to war. It is a resolution that the president has presented that would make strategic attacks on the accumulation of chemical warfare that has been used to kill over a thousand people, including 400 children. And this is something that, according to the United Nations, is not the norm. What is the norm? It is that you cannot use chemical warfare in any kind of rebellion or any kind of attack or even at war. And so uh, I agree with the president that something has to be done. The United States must react because we are the world leader and we can't close our eyes to that. Mm -hmm. what has occurred is that I have participated in several of the conference calls that took place on Monday and Tuesday of this week. And I expressed my concerns as I did when we did have a resolution to go to war against Iraq. And I voted against it. And that was that I wanted to know what kind of a time frame were we talking about uh, being in Syria. Number two, I wanted to know that we had other countries working with us as had occurred in the previous administration of George Bush I, where they had a 90-day war and they had 39 countries working with the United States. All of this uh, started the concerns that I had, and I wanted to know, where are we going to get the money to be able to do that since we are in sequestration? And I wanted to know that there was an exit plan that we would go in and get out. So having said that, several of the leaders in the Democratic Party came out with a resolution yesterday that addresses that, those points. Number one is that there will be no troops on the ground. That's no, no changing from that. Good. Number two, that we do have a few countries that have said that they will come to our defense and to our help so that it is a joint effort. Number three, that it cannot exceed 60 days. In the Senate, the, the uh, Foreign Relations Committee passed a, a uh, resolution that says no more than 60 days with a possibility of a 30-day extension provided Congress approves it. And then that um, there are countries that are signing up now mm -hmm. to, uh, to join the United States. So having said that, 
I uh, asked if uh, members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, where I am the chairman, could meet with the administration by telephone. And we did that yesterday for one hour. Many of the members from the West Coast to the East Coast were able to participate, express their concerns, how their constituents are reacting, which is something similar to what I have here in, in deep South Texas. And that is that they're afraid that we're going into another war. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to correct that. Okay, re I repeat, this is not a resolution to go to war against Syria. It is a strategic attack that the president and the Department of Defense have, uh, have set up in a way that is, it is classified and we cannot discuss it. But I can say this, that I'm beginning to get a little bit more comfortable so, as my concerns have been addressed. And it will be debated starting Monday and uh, hopefully late Tuesday night or Wednesday, I hope that it comes to the floor for a House vote. Are you all keeping um, your constituents um, informed through your website? Do you do updates on Yes, that? we are okay. doing that not only through our website, but we are actually doing a survey and we're calling in each of the counties that I represent and asking some of the leadership who are elected officials especially and uh, people in education and people in health care and people in infrastructure to uh, give us their feedback because I did that before I made up my mind back when we went to war with Iraq. Mm -hmm. So I will do what is best for our country. I will do what is best for our state. I will do the best that will be for our district of the 15th Congressional District. So with that, I think that people can feel comfortable that I will do the right thing. I remember interviewing you on um, uh, September, right after the September 11th attack, uh, you came down. I was still with McAllen, and you came and, and you uh, came and you delivered a message to the community. Uh, and I remember that uh, very vividly in my mind. Uh, so I know you were, you are uh, concerned about the, you know, what is happening and you will do the very best that you think uh, is the best thing for, for, for the U.S. Thank you, Edmund. <laughs> Uh, voting rights. Uh, right now, uh, Congressman, we have a uh, special election happening right here in Edinburgh. Uh, we had a council member who left his position and we had to hold a special election to uh, fill that position. The state of Texas also has enforced the uh, new voting requirement, uh, a new voting law, which requires uh, Texans to show a photo ID when they come to vote. We've heard, you know, from both sides that, you know, it's going to disenfranchise the minority communities, but we've also heard uh, from voters that have shown up to vote. Uh, we've had over 300 people show up for early voting. Early voting goes on till September the 10th, and we've had over 300 people show up to vote, uh, haven't received any complaints here at City Hall. Uh, but what what can be done um, and what are your thoughts as, as the chairman of the Hispa Hispanic Caucus? Um, is there anything that we can do? I, I know that, um, that the federal government is, is deeply against this um, uh, and I know that, that you know, lawsuits have already been filed, but what are your thoughts and what can be done? Irma, I opposed it. I was very much uh, together with our Valley delegation of our Texas State Senator Chuy Hosa and the state representatives against it. I know that uh, there was about two thirds Republican in the Texas legislature and about one third Democrat. And we didn't have the votes to stop it. We tried and I, I compliment our Valley delegation for all the effort that they made. But now that it's the law in the state of Texas, then of course we have to abide by it. Yeah. But I have to say that uh, there is one caveat in the law that says that if you come, you have the, the ID, but you didn't bring it with you to vote, they will let you cast a provisional vote. Mm -hmm. And you have six days in which to come back and show proof of identification. So <clears throat> I urge everyone to do everything that they can to come mm -hmm. with identification so that they can cast their vote. It's very important. We had a, a fantastic turnout in the Rio Grande Valley in the election of 2012, yes. and I hope that we continue in 2013 and 2014, and especially in 2016 when we will elect a new president uh, after President Obama, Obama completes his second term. So we'll live with it.
Exactly. We had a, one of the TV stations, local TV stations, did an interview with some people out at the polls, and there was a gentleman that, that uh, they brought in, and he voted curbside, and he said, um, I have my ID right here. He said, he said, I went and I got it. He said, it's free. He says, I wasn't going to let anybody keep me from voting. He said, I've been voting for 83 years <laughs> and I'm going to make sure I'm ready to vote. And I was so proud of him. And, and just want to remind our viewers that, you know, DPS does uh, offer the voter identifications completely free. You just have to go by one of their offices and you fill out the, the, the little application. They will take your picture and you get it for absolutely free. So it's great information. Have, yes, definitely. Great information. Uh, Congressman, his history made uh, this year with the merger of our universities, and you're a big proponent. You've been involved in education, you know, for a very long time. And what a historic day to bring those universities together. And now we get part of the Puff Fund, but we also get a medical school. Oh, let me tell you, that was a definitely a historic event that we celebrated. I was here. Uh, to see and witness the, the signing of that law, legislation into law by Rick Perry and uh, all the regions who were here, especially our state democratic, excuse me, our state legislators, uh, as representatives and senators, all were here and I witnessed that myself. I was on the stage. I can say that this is one of the milestones that I had dreamed of someday happening, and that is that we would be able to be a big, super big uh, university. Do you know that when I went to Congress, there were 8,000 people enrolled at UT Pan American? Today, there are over 20,000. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you that the community college only had about 5,000. Today, there are over 30,000. So as you can see, these are going to give us a big help to go to another level because we will have much more money from the Puff Fund for buildings and whatever is necessary through research. But I also say this, that adding a medical school on top of the merger is what no one, at least in, in this, <laughs> I was ever with, mm -hmm. thought that it would be a combination of the merger and a medical school at the same time. So there will be a boom that yeah. will someday make us look like San Antonio, who has, you know, a big medical school there and a whole uh, medical complex that has uh, helped San Antonio and Bear County and the surrounding area uh, be able to grow and prosper. So I am fully in favor of it. I am going to be helping and working by trying to provide federal funding for the schools and the programs that will make it a big success. Have you uh, pitched a name yet for the new university? <laughs> I've already submitted two or Good. three names that I would like for them to consider, but I know that that's a decision made by the okay. Board of Regents, and I will respect whatever they decide. Very good. Maybe we all have that by the end of the year. I hope so. <laughs> and speaking of um, the medical school, Obamacare. Um, also, uh, very uh, in the forefront, uh, you know, of, of national news. Uh, everybody's talking about it right now. Um, give us an update on that. Well, it's quite interesting because <clears throat> about a month ago, President Obama called my office and talked to my chief of staff, one of his uh, staffers, the chief of staff called my chief of staff and said, is there any possibility that Congressman Inhofe says the chairman of the caucus bring all the members to my office and that we talk about this uh, Affordable Health Care Act. And we did. Where we thought we were going to get 30 to 40 minutes, he gave us an hour and a half. And another surprise that he gave us was that he invited Vice President Joe Biden to be at that meeting. So what a pleasure it was to be able to speak to the president and the vice president and, of course, surrounded by all the members of, Cong of the caucus who attended. And he said that this was something that he was going to ask us to go back to our respective districts and have uh, meetings where we could train the trainers so that they would be prepared to enroll the over 40 million people in the country who are uninsured. And that if we did a good job, that we would see that this program will work. It will be much more affordable, and we have been doing that. We've been 
we have a team of 10 people in my Edinburgh district office with uh, that is one of the highest priorities of the president and uh, and myself as as the uh, congressman of the 15th district and we're having a great deal of success and we are going to uh, have about six months from October the 1st through the end of March to be able to enroll everyone we possibly can. This region is one of the highest uninsured populations in the whole country with approximately 40% uninsured. And I'm of the opinion, I am of the opinion that the state legislators want this to happen. They want to enroll people because it has already been through the test of having the Supreme Court look and see if it was constitutional and if it passed the requirements. And sure enough, they said it is, it is acceptable under the constitution of our land, of our country. So now what we have to do is what happened back under Lyndon Baines Johnson when he brought different types of civil rights legislation that needed some tweaking and that was the voters protection to be able to go to vote back in 1965. But he also brought the Social Security and Medicare which was objected by many people, maybe 30 percent like we have right now with Affordable Care Act, but it needed some tweaking over the years, took about maybe three to five years, but it became such a very important piece of legislation, Social Security and Medicare, that since I went to Congress 17 years ago, I saw where all people fought to protect Social Security and Medicare the way that they did. They didn't want it privatized. They didn't want to take high risk and have people from Wall Street investing our Social Security uh, account. That is what I will retire on. Or the Medicare, which is those of us who are already of age to be able to participate in Medicare, want it protected. The same thing will happen with Affordable Health, with the Affordable Care Act. And I am supporting it. I'm doing everything I can to work with doctors, with our hospitals, with the caregivers and the community clinics so that we can tweak it as necessary and make it one of the signature issues of our, of our time. So that our people will be able to afford to seek medical help if they need it. Um, you know, I see so many people that, in fact, you know, I, I, I've spoken to people with cancer who say, I, I don't go to the doctor because I don't have insurance. They don't offer it at my job. And that's so sad. Well, remember there was a cap of $1 million that's been removed. Yeah. There was, uh, uh, I guess, something in the insurance companies that said that if you had pre-existing medical conditions, we couldn't insure you. Well, that's been taken out. There was something in the, in the way that they had their... Um, I guess their business set up that women had to pay more than men for an insurance policy. That's gone. Uh, you could uh, insure your children up to age uh, 20. That has now been raised to age 26. Yeah. Listen, there are so many things that help children, young teenagers that help young adults, all women, all men, provided that we all work together and make this one of the signature issues of our time. Very good. We will see that. <laughs> I-69, the I-69 designation, that is also huge for us. We are going to see so many doors open for not only Edinburgh, but the entire Rio Grande Valley. You were a leader in that, Congressman. Uh, thank you for what you've done for us already, uh, but I know that more still needs to come, and I know that you're there at, the, at their door <laughs> saying, we need more. I uh, started in 1997 and I got to meet the Secretary of Transportation. I told him that I'd met with the President and I'd said, why is it that our Rio Grande Valley is not connected to San Antonio or Houston and Dallas? And uh, they simply said that we were too small and that uh, they didn't have that much money to be able to build an interstate highway. But that's not true. We, the leaders, elected officials, both state and federal said 
we will not take no for an answer. And we fought it and fought it, and we were able to garner the federal funds to be able to take the existing highway of 77 and 281 and build them to federal specifications. And how proud I was the day that we unveiled the signage that said Interstate Highway 69 and Interstate Highway 2 that connects us from Mac Mission McAllen all the way to Harlingen because it also is an interstate highway number two. So what is it going to do? It's going to continue to bring a lot of companies that want to expand or to start up businesses here in Deep South Texas. It will increase commerce. It will increase the trade with Mexico that has grown so much since NAFTA was approved. I believe that this area with education and a medical uh, school and the hospitals that have grown so much here in our area will attract a lot more doctors. We'll, we'll educate a lot of doctors here who will stay, and nursing is just phenomenal. All of this to say that allied health and science is of great importance to our universities, our colleges, and our universities, and that our growth here, which was phenomenal in 2000 and 2010, by 2020, this area will not be at today's population of one and a half million. It will exceed two million and two million will jump to three and then four okay. and this area honestly is going to be a great place to live and work and raise families exactly it, it, predominantly the now the hispanic community is is now the majority instead of the minority is it is it that we are getting more attention here and maybe more federal dollars because of that or is it just our area and the boom you know what's happening here do you want to know the truth yes because <laughs> politicians sometimes uh, give you a lot of rhetoric the truth is that washington including austin and our state capital. Elected officials pay great attention to how many people come out to vote and how much money they can raise to help them get elected. Those are two very strong points. And this area has learned that and consequently we are bringing federal elected officials here, senators, cabinet members. We have brought many state officials from the governor down to the uh, the uh, state controller and, and others. I can say that we have learned what Houston and Dallas knew a long time ago, and that was to come to Washington and make a case for some of the applications for funding, for programs, for infrastructure, highways, bridges, airports, water ports, clearing whatever the obstacles are to be able to make trade and commerce the success that we will have in this region because of the improvements that we just discussed. Yeah. So I can say that I will continue to work in a coalition of elected officials right now. Our coalition includes Congressman Vela, Congressman Cuellar, and myself. We are the three uh, congressmen on the Texas-Mexico border. We're working together on all of these issues that we have discussed up to this point, and there's others. But I want to say that the veterans are also very important. Yes. And we did what naysayers said would never happen, and that is to have the Veterans Medical Center in Harlingen that was, uh, that was uh, celebrated the grand opening two years ago. And we are, that's phase one. We are working together with our state senators, Cornyn and uh, Cruz, to be able to get a phase two funding that would build a and a wing on that uh, building, four-story building, for an emergency room and add 30, a uh, room for 30 beds, and then we can change the name to Veterans Hospital. So it's quite exciting yes. to uh, see the good things that have happened. Uh, again, we didn't know it couldn't be done, and that's why we work so hard and we will continue in these coalitions working for regional projects because the president has told us if you want your your programs funded you're going to have to do more with less money and so we are now doing many of the big projects as regional instead of just for the city 
that we represent. Before we run out of time, I, I just want to ask you, how much has this area changed, um, Congressman, from when you uh, were a businessman in Mercedes? Um, you know, how, how much has, has it grown and, and how excited are you that we are moving forward? Well, when I uh, finished college at the University of Texas in 1962, 50 years ago, I uh, was only 21 and I came to work with the family and I put to use the training and the education that I received in the School of Business Administration. And we were able to grow our business to over 300 employees and sales that exceeded 50 million. We were distributing products all over the state of Texas, all the way to California. And they th thought it couldn't be done. <laughs> it was difficult because we didn't have the highway system that uh, we needed, but we sometimes had to contract others to do it. But it has grown tremendously. Our population has gone from 350,000 in Hidalgo County to 850,000. Edinburgh has grown now to over 80,000 people in this last census and will exceed 100,000 by the next census. So Edinburgh and the surrounding area, uh, the MSA of McAllen, Edinburgh, Mission, PSA, it's amazing what has happened here. Uh, the uh, taxable assets have grown from 10 billion to over 35 billion dollars of assets to be that can be taxed. So those are making a lot of difference, but I'll say this, the biggest the biggest help that we got is the state and federal investment in education, early childhood education, then K through 12, then the colleges and then of course community colleges and then the universities. That is making lots and lots of difference. A lot of opportunities for people here in the Valley. You bet. This is a great place to live. Uh, Congressman, before we run out of time, I do want to give you an opportunity to address your constituents. Um, you know, if you've got a message for us, or something you'd like to share, we'd love to hear. Thank you. I uh, want to say that I'm honored. It is a, indeed a privilege to be an elected federal official in Washington representing a very large population in my district of over 700,000 people. But I worked together. I found out that I couldn't do it alone. And I have created coalitions that are not only on the Texas-Mexico border, but that also include Corpus and San Antonio and Houston and Dallas. And by doing that, we have bipartisan legislation that has passed, giving us the biggest investment in higher education since the GI Bill of 1945. There are more women and minority students attending colleges and universities because of the $221 million that we now have for HSIs, Hispanic Serving Institutions like UT Pan American here in Edinburgh and South Texas College. So by doing that, we were able to do what the naysayers said couldn't be done. It was a regional effort to fix the levy system so that we wouldn't get flooded in the way that New Orleans and Louisiana got hit back with the hurricane of Katrina and the Rita uh, hurricane. So again, I want to say that uh, we are making great progress and we cannot stop. We have to keep with the same momentum being involved with the federal government, with the state government, with our county government, with our municipal government, and especially taking good care of our school districts by electing good state board, of a, a rather city uh, school board members to do the work that they're expected to do so that we can get our students college ready and going and graduating from colleges and universities. Very good. Congressman, I know that uh, your time is limited, but we really appreciate you coming by to visit with us and keeping us updated as to what is happening in Washington and, and, and the tasks that, you know, come before you, uh, because we really don't know what your day is like there, but uh, I imagine it's stressful. Uh, it, it is always very fast. It's a fast pace that we live in yeah. Washington. But I want to say this, those who listen to me, please approve a line item on the budget of each government 
to allow their elected officials to come to Washington, like other regions of the country, come and walk the halls of Congress, speak to their congressmen, speak to their senators, and make a case on why they should appro approve programs and fund them through appropriations, just like they do in the big cities and in the big states. Uh, we are second largest. California is the only one that has more congressmen than we do. But I see a great improvement in people coming to Washington. Don't criticize them because they come up there to work. It's hard, mm -hmm. tough work to do. So urge them to come to Washington as many times as necessary to get the job done. My dad used to have a saying, hablando se entienden las cosas. And I guess that fits in here. You know, if we want something done, we got to speak up. Esos dichos son muy ciertos. <laughs> Thank you so much, Congressman, for coming by and keeping us updated. We appreciate your presence today. Thank you, Irma. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching Legislative Update on the Edinburgh Cable Network. I'm Irma Garza.